Whoever will take a warning, let him beware of Zwingli and shun his books as the prince of hell's poison. For the man is completely perverted and has entirely lost Christ. These are the words of the renowned Martin Luther from his writing Confessions Concerning Christ's Supper in 1528, Germany. He wrote these words about a contemporary of his, Ulrich Zwingli, who's not very far away in Switzerland, was setting ablaze with his own reformation away from the teachings of the Catholic Church, forming what we know today as a reformation, Protestantism. What were they fighting over? Why such strong language and warning from Martin Luther some 500 years ago? Because the topic they were discussing was as dire as life and death. In 1529, attempts were made to bring these two great reformers together, reformers and pastors together. And while they had many similar theological beliefs between Luther and Zwingli, such as there is only one true God, that the Son of God became human, born of the Virgin Mary, that original sin was born in us and inherited from Adam, that faith is a gift from God, and we are unable to earn it with proceeding deeds or merit, even on the topic of baptism, but one topic was quite divisive for them. It was not directly political or race or even over gender wars. But the topic that these two men fought over, reasoned from Scripture and life and debated over, was the topic of the Lord's Supper. Believe it or not, how we celebrate the Lord's Supper here at Roingbrook ties to this man Luther calls the prince of hell's poison. He calls someone completely perverted and someone who has entirely lost Christ, Ulrich Zwingli, for his views on communion, the Lord's Supper. Talk about communion as being one of the two sacraments that we look to. Before we engage in these different viewpoints, before we digest some of the words of Paul and this, his take on communion, let's step back and ask ourselves, what is that we are trying to accomplish today in regards to communion? According to the Gospel Coalition, a sacrament or ordinance is this, that is given by God, instituted by Christ, namely baptism and the Lord's Supper are visible signs and seals that we are bound together as a community of faith by his death and resurrection. By our use of them, the Holy Spirit more fully declares and seals the promise of the gospel to us. Now, if you were raised Catholic, you might recall that the Catholic Church views that there are seven sacraments. Yes? <laughs> yep, there we go. That's seven sacraments. They would call them baptism, confirmation, the Eucharist, penance, reconciliation, anointing of the sick, holy orders, and matrimony. As Baptists, we like to simplify this to mean only two. So not seven, just two. Since the Reformation, Protestants have again only recognized these two commands or ordinances given by God for the church. If a law passes in a town or city or legislative body can implement an ordinance on the people living there, a particular town. The county passes an ordinance, uh, perhaps of what you can or cannot do with your property, your animals, and so forth. God, in a similar way, has an ordinance for his church, enacted and prescribed by Christ while on earth. These two ordinances or sacraments 
our baptism and the Lord's Supper, which we will partake of in a little bit. Two words, I hope, that will stick with you. When you think about sacraments such as baptism, which happens once in our life, and the Lord's Supper, which we do often, I hope the words that stick with you are the words sign and seal. Sign and seal. A sign because of what it symbolizes, what it represents to us in the life and the work of Christ on the cross. But also a seal. And that just as Christ said, it is finished on the cross. Christ did not have to die multiple times, just one time for all time. The seal is furnished by the Holy Spirit. Someone who wants to finish a piece of oak or cherry or pine, they might apply stain and they might put one or more coats of sealer on that piece of wood. They seal the piece of wood and at the end of the day they say, I hope I never have to do that again. I hope that lasts for a lifetime. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 describes the work of the Holy Spirit as a seal that lasts for a lifetime. Paul says, when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed in him, you were also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. He goes on to say that he is the down payment for our inheritance, for the redemption of the possession, to the praise of his glory. If you believe in Christ, you are sealed with his Holy Spirit as though like a down payment for our inheritance. When we partake in baptism, which happens once in the life of a believer, and then partake of the Lord's Supper, which happens what we do here each and every month, we are recognizing this sign and the seal of the sacraments. And when your kids are younger, they're trying to understand life as you travel here and there. They might see a road sign and ask their parents, you know, what does that sign mean? You know, it says 35, but I see that you're doing 55. How does that work? Or the sign says, wrong way, turn around, but you just keep driving, mom and dad, towards that direction. A few years ago, I saw a number of more signs that were being planted that said, stop sign ahead. Stop sign ahead, which might seem confusing to a child. It's not telling you to act at that moment, only to know that there's going to be a stop sign in the very near future ahead of you. In a similar way, like that stop sign ahead tells you that there's going to be a stop sign on your route, on your route. Baptism and communion are like that sign as well, because they point back to Christ, what he has done for us on the cross. But not only as a reminder, but a blessing in being baptized and a blessing when we take of the Lord's Supper as a community of believers who desire to live for him. Last week, we discussed baptism as Baptist, Roaring Brook Baptist Church, and a topic that in our everyday life and even in conversions, conversations of churches in our time uh, often could care less about the significance of baptism. You know, like items in our house, you know, sometimes we have to uh, brush the dust off. We have to do that with baptism as well because it's a sacrament of the church. It's a part of our identity here at Roaring Brook Baptist Church. So we looked at some of the technical confessions in our constitution regarding baptism. We looked at some familiar or simpler passages that describe baptism, how it came on the scene in the New Testament. We began by asking the question, where did baptism come from? Where does it come from? We start in the third chapter of Matthew, the third chapter in of the New Testament. Suddenly John, who is John the Baptist, starts preaching a message of repentance. And we notice that the people or that John doesn't go out to the people, doesn't go to the multitudes, but the multitudes find him. They go out to the wilderness, out to the desert to hear John. And, and hearing his message, they repent and they're baptized. And we say, where did baptism come from? 
You know, the, nobody raises their hand and say, hey, John, what is this baptism stuff that you're talking about? Why should we be baptized? No, instead, they heard the message and were, bapti- and were baptized. We drew from a few passages in the Old Testament that associate this nature uh, of washing, whether it be that of a priest before a sacrifice or a general washing before a festival. Many of you wash your hands before you eat. You know, God instilled his people to do that before a festival. David in Psalm 51 asked God to wash him from his sins, from his iniquities. And in some way, this is like a precursor or a forerunner to baptism that we see in the New Testament. This washing with repentance helped pave the way for baptism in the New Testament. John's message of repent, and then the people were baptized. And it began to strike the hearts of God's people. And to that we see the action was that of baptism. John baptizing in the wilderness. We looked at John the Baptist in three ways. First, we looked at the man in Matthew 3 who spoke like a prophet of old. Quoting from Isaiah 40, verse 3, a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. You see, John looked the part of a prophet wearing these mountain man clothes, camel hair garment and a leather belt. You know, he wasn't setting out to make a fashion statement with his attire. Instead, he was making a statement from heaven. The young people might say, oh, John the Baptist went viral here. People were flocking to him. But they also accepted his message as though he was a prophet. Second, not only the man, but the myth. He attracted people, we're told in Matthew 3, 5, that they were flocking to him to be baptized as they confessed their sins. He wasn't popular because of his dress. He wasn't popular because of his family, but because of his prophetic-like message, his call to God's people to repent because the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Lastly, the man, the myth, came with a message. And that resulted in the same message that Christ takes on in Matthew 4.17. His message in that Christ's first sermon, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. See, John's demeanor was prophetic. And his message was accepted, or a call to action accepted by God's people. Even the Pharisees didn't know how to handle John. Jesus questioned to them in Luke 20, 4 through 6. He asked them if John's baptism was from heaven or earth. And they don't know how to answer that. So what? Taking this into consideration, John is baptism, how it sprung from the Old Testament, correlation with repentance, the, the washing of the priest and the people and repentance of sin. We reason that John's baptism, though it was repentance, confession of sin, was lacking one thing, one element that is realized in Christ's baptism, and that's the incorporation of the Holy Spirit. Luke 3, 16 and Acts 19 demonstrate that. The question then became, why should anyone here who's on the fence about baptism be baptized? Why should you get baptized? The answer is because God has ordained it in the life of his people. It's a sign of the blessing that Christ has brought into your life in his life, death, and resurrection. When someone is plunged into the water, it symbolizes they have died with Christ. And then they're brought out of the water to show that they've been made alive with Christ. And we do this in front of others to proclaim to them what God has done in your life and that you desire to live for Him. But for those who have believed and been baptized, there's no need to be rebaptized. I've heard of some who have gone to the Holy Land. And while they were there, they were 
rebaptized in the Jordan River. And pastors were being asked if they could rebaptize rebaptize someone uh, in the Jordan River, the exact spot, you know, where Christ was baptized. How cool would that be? The same location of where Christ was baptized, they too could be baptized or re-baptized. Sadly, though, it's not about the location, but the work of baptism is more important. It's the focus that has what has taken place in your life, the work of Christ. But second, in your heart and life. And lastly, the work that's being done as you relate to the body of Christ, relate to others in community. You haven't been baptized. There's a sign-up sheet up here. Don't delay. Sign up to be baptized today. (laughs) As we approach communion, though, the Lord's Supper this morning, what are we doing? And what is it in relationship to Christ? A few Romans in the second century called Christians cannibals. In describing who and what Christians were doing in secret, They heard the terms body and blood being used and even thought that early Christians were sacrificing infant children as part of the Lord's Supper. While the Romans, or some of these Romans were very wrong and off base, today people have their own views about church. Some of the things we do as they hear bits and pieces of the church or even attended a few times and quickly described the church as a cult or disturbing gathering of people instead of seeing the work of Christ and his love in the body of Christ. Let's examine the Lord's Supper in Matthew briefly and we'll turn to Paul's take on it before as we approach the Lord's table ourselves very shortly. Turn with me to Matthew 26, verses 26 and 30. Matthew 26 verses 26 through 30. Matthew 26, beginning in verse 26. As they were eating, Jesus took bread blessed and broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood that established the covenant. It is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I tell you from this moment, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the day I drink it in a new way in my Father's kingdom with you. After singing hymns, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Someone asked me a few weeks ago during Easter, why did Jesus and his disciples eat the Passover early? Why did here Jesus and his disciples eat the Passover early? early. And the answer here is found in the words of Matthew 26, where Jesus says, this is my body. This is my blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus ate the Passover meal early to demonstrate that on Passover, as you might recall in the Old Testament, that a lamb would be slain. But here, no longer would there be a a lamb needed to be slain for the sacrifice of sin. But one final lamb to be sacrificed. That is Jesus. The final lamb. Remember the words of John the Baptist in John 1, 29 and 30? 
where it says, On the next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one about whom I said, After me comes a man who is greater than I am, because he existed before me. Jesus is telling his disciples that he is the final Passover lamb. Now, there could be more said about this phrase, this is my body. If you were raised Catholic in the Catholic tradition, in the taking of the Eucharist, during the supper, uh, many would say that the bread and the wine become the body of Christ in our forgiveness. Looking back on church history, none of the reformers retain this notion that the bread or the wine become the body in the Lord's Supper, the body of Christ. So back to our criticism of Zwingli. Luther believed, though, that still Christ was present in communion. Not specifically in the elements, but he would argue that Christ's body is everywhere. Now, when we take communion, Luther argues that Christ is essential, natural, true. He's completely God and man in one person, undivided and inseparable. That the right hand of God, Luther would say, is everywhere. The word of God is not false or deceitful. And that God has and knows various ways to be present in a certain place, not just local. You say, I thought this position or our position on communion resembled that of Zwingli, not Luther, and you are correct. For Zwingli, as in Baptists, in a similar way, look at communion as a memorial as we commemorate the death, burial, resurrection of Christ and the finished work of Christ on the cross. While Luther's perspective might sound as though it resembles that of the Catholic tradition, that the bread and the wine become the body of Jesus. As though each and every time you go to church uh, for the Eucharist, that Christ in Luther and the Reformer's mind, that he would have to be sacrificed week after week after week. The Reformers say no. Christ died on the cross once. His sacrifice was sufficient was sufficient. The finished work of Christ on the cross, it was done once and for all time. Zwingli then would then encourage us to think of the Lord's Supper as a sign of what he says, a sacred thing. That grace that has been given. Just like a stop sign ahead. It points to a sign ahead of you that tells you you're getting closer. So action must take place, so too communion points back to the work of Christ, the final sacrifice of Christ for sin through his work on the cross. In communion in the Lord's Supper, we remember that we take up the Lord's Supper as a body of Christ together. You know, if this was meant to be individualistic, then we'd all give you these little to-go packets. And you could take them wherever you wanted to, out in your car, take them home, and have communion by yourself. But instead, we do this together as a body of believers. Partake in the Lord's Supper, communion, as we remember what Christ has done for us on the cross. For some of you, you've never heard the name Ulrich Zwingli, who lived some 500 years ago. And when you come to church, you're not typically thinking about these most heated debates many years ago, or even the culture and the topics from the days of Jesus or Paul or Abraham. Instead, you're thinking about the news this past week, the headings from this past week, gas prices, war with Iran, credit card statements, health insurance, relationships, job opportunities. How is tomorrow Monday already? In a world that seems to live moment by moment, 
How does communion make any difference at all? We do it month after month. Month after month. And that's the point. It demonstrates to others what Christ has done for us. Why do we observe communion month after month, year after year? According to Paul in 1 Corinthians 10.16, he says we share in a blessing at the Lord's table. He says, is not the cup of blessing that we share in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread that we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread. We who are many are one body, for we all share the one bread. You know, it's easy for us to mindlessly partake of communion and think, oh, we have to take communion today. It's communion Sunday. Instead of realizing we get to take of communion. We get to partake together. I get to receive a blessing from God, sharing in the blood of Christ as we commemorate His death, burial, His resurrection, once for all. Something we continually share in, and every time we partake in the bread and the cup, we think about Christ's one sacrifice for us. 2,000 years later, the Lord's Supper has endured. And believe it or not, it will outlast our problems. It will outlast our concerns in 2024. Remember the sign. Remember the seal. Know that God has demonstrated His grace to you in the death of Christ and has sealed us with the Holy Spirit, the down payment until the day we will be with Him. Profess Christ in communion today. Because we are communing with God as we're seeking to live in union with each other. When I first started pastoring at Welsh, there was a little box I was handed. And I opened it and found that there was uh, a few communion cups in a container, a container that you could put the crackers or croutons in and one for grape juice. Here was a travel communion set. You take the shut-ins, those who were in the hospital, those who couldn't, couldn't physically make it to church. You could take communion to them, share this blessing with them those who couldn't make it that Sunday. Something that we, something like communion was regular and even bland for me as a kid. But something that these people who are facing the toughest times in their lives craved, cherished, eagerly desired for you to take communion to them. Now, I think it's easy for us to idolize that this event and make it salvific like the Catholic Church and sometimes other Protestant traditions. But at the end of the day, perhaps nearing the end of life, one of the greatest traits of communion is that of Christian belonging. Belonging to the body of Christ. Belonging to people. At times, we need to look closely at the details, carefully at Scripture, constantly thinking about our tradition, calmly at history, but all the time, let's look contently on Christ and His love for us. Communion is a sign. It's a seal. It's a blessing. It also reminds us that we belong we belong. So let's prepare our hearts to share together this Communion Sunday as we partake this morning.